Hello, this is Alan Hess, author of Googie Modern, Architectural Drawings of Arme Davis and Newlove, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. G.E. Kidder Smith was a trained architect and architectural historian. A prolific scholar, teacher, and author, he is the subject of a new book by Angela Maggi. Joining us today from Switzerland is Kidder's son, internationally acclaimed lutist, or is it lutenist, Hoppy Smith. And from Chicago, architectural historian and author Michelangelo Sabatino, who wrote the foreword to this book. We're also heading to the Motor City a little later on to talk with Detroit architect Michael Porras of Macintosh Porras, helping bring back that city from some pretty bleak times. And then later on, music with returning jazz artist the delightful Diana Panton. And now, here's your host, retired jazz artist, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Hey, thanks, Tom. Yes, as most of our listeners know who stick with it through the credits of each show, I sing the theme song accompanied by Robinson Earl. It was my first and final public recording. Although I was in a choir on and off from age 4 to 15, these were church choirs primarily. So when we wanted to get down, get funky, get loose, it was all in Latin. <laughs> Punctuated on holidays with a few 1940s carols and some G-rated Broadway tunes like Oklahoma and The Sound of Music. There was certainly no chorus line or avenue Q. <laughs> yeah. At age 11, I went from one of those boy choir sopranos to a bass in about a week, and then a few years later stopped singing completely. So while I have no singing voice left, I'm always grateful for my parents' love of jazz. They took me to the swankiest jazz nightclubs in Raleigh at the time, the Players' Retreat and the Frog and Nightgown. And then later in college, I had the good fortune to hang out with Gary Shivers and Carol Sloan at WUNC Public Radio in Chapel Hill. All of this to say, I share my love of jazz, especially vocalists, as the show moves into its ninth year. Can you believe that, Tom? I don't know. I'm just sort of looking back here and realizing that it was, what, late 2014, early 2015, you first came into the studio here and you wanted to do a podcast about architecture, but you're not an architect, and you'd never been in a studio, and I showed you how much it was going to cost, and you said, okay. <laughs> and then you said you wanted to sing a goofy theme song. I mean, I wasn't so sure the show would survive the theme music. Well, in fact, it only lasted about six months. Well, In 2015, <laughs> we recorded shows and tried to get media coverage and listeners and publicity, and it was really hard. And that was back when there were only about 250,000 podcasts. There are millions now. Yeah, I think everybody has a podcast now. We closed the show in the fall of 2015, and then around Christmas— like a Hallmark holiday miracle, <laughs> oh, yeah. magazines and blogs came out with their best of design podcast list, and we were on it, sometimes at number one. So we got the band back together, and it's been full steam ahead ever since. Thanks so much to all our listeners who jog with us, drive with us, cook with us, walk with us, and who knows what else with us every week. We truly appreciate being able to share these stories and musical guests with you. Amen. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Hopkinson Hoppy Smith is an acclaimed lutist and retired music teacher who's joining us today from Basel, Switzerland. He is the son of the late G.E. Kidder Smith, an award-winning American architectural historian, photographer, and preservationist. Michelangelo Sabatino is a professor of architectural history and preservation in the College of Architecture at IIT in Chicago, where he directs the Ph.D. program. Michelangelo recently wrote the foreword to Angela Maggi's new book, G.E. Kidder Smith Builds, devoted to Kidder's many travels to photograph architecture around the world. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, Hoppy and Michelangelo. 
Hello, hello. Hello, George, and it's always a pleasure to be here with you. Hoppy, before we get started on your dad, mm -hmm. are you a lutist or a lutinist? Because I've seen it both ways. I'm both. <laughs> You're both? Oh, are they yeah. different skills? <laughs> it's the same skill. Uh, normally, lutinist is the word, but lutist, people understand. Okay. Lutinist sounds a little more polished. Okay, but you don't play the lutin. You play <laughs> the lute. I play the lute, and the lute is not just one instrument. It's a family of instruments. Really? Oh. So I several instruments, all with plucked strings, mostly from the Renaissance and Baroque periods. Well, that's my next question. Tell our listeners about the lute, because it's not a very well-known musical instrument by the public, and there are a lot of strings. There are many strings, and as time passed, it collected more and more strings. <laughs> the first lute music we have, solo lute music, is from around 1500. And this is for the six-course lute. A course is the double string, which is actually on the... On the six course, you have five double courses, that makes 10 strings, and a single top string, the chanterelle, which makes 11 strings. And at the end of the century, you have not only six course, but you have seven, eight course, nine course lutes. Into the 17th century, 10 and 11 course lutes, etc. In the time of J.S. Bach in the 18th century, 13 course lutes. Wow, wow. You have to have really big hands, don't you? Well, the strings are spaced in such a way that you should be able to get them with little practice. Okay. Now, Hoppy, I'm a Star Trek fan, so I have to ask this question. Have you ever run across a Vulcan lute like Spock played on Star Trek? You know, I must confess my ignorance here. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. And you say you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I never said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I think we did, but... So, Hoppy, you'll want to Google Spock's Vulcan Lute, which was a musical instrument he played on the original Star Trek series in the 60s. Okay. That was the only cultural popular reference point I could find in my search on lutes, other than you, that pops up everywhere. So we're really glad to have you on the show. I've written it down, and I will check afterwards. Ah, thanks. Now, Michelangelo, we wanted to get author Angelo Macchi on today, but he's under the weather. So thank you for pitching in. Tell us about this book for which you wrote the foreword. Well, all of the credit goes to Angelo, of course, who initially reached out to the family, Hoppy and Kidder Smith Jr., which is Hoppy's brother. At the time, they had just suffered the loss of their mom and their dad, of course, G.E. Kidder Smith had died several years before, and they were trying to figure out what to do with this amazing archive of photos. And so Kidder died just as the digital turn was gearing up and analog was quickly falling out of uh, fashion. And so many of these uh, photos had just, you know, laid there in the archive. Of course, they were, they were published in these 15 books, you know, that Kidder produced during his lifetime but they were not beginning to circulate too much in terms of digital. So Angelo had the foresight to ask the family, and they had the generosity to say yes, to donate the archives to the UAV University in Venice. And from that point on, Angelo began to think about a book about how to best represent the contributions of Peter Smith. History uh, is always cruel. For a man who had produced so much, and interesting, not only books about Sweden and Italy and Switzerland, but also a series of monumental tomes on the U.S., no one knew who Kidder Smith was anymore, right? So the great achievement of this book is to sort of restudy his books and put them into context. Hoppy, your dad traveled all over the world, and he took you with him, right? Some of the time, yes, there were trips we did together, and we were... Uh, hanging on, playing our guitars in the car and trying to keep busy while he was having his great inspirational moment of photographing and commenting on architectural wonders here and there. Yeah, we spent a couple of summers in Europe with him, but the basic work that he did on the States, on Sweden, on Switzerland, on Italy, the new churches of Europe, these were all projects that really involved mainly him and my mother. 
And my mother was a great companion and a great notator of words of wisdom that he could fathom in an instant. He was a wonderful, spontaneous deliverer of reactions to interesting buildings and settings and so forth. And she would often (laughs) write the things down and he would then edit it afterwards. But the family side was mainly a couple of summers in Europe. And then, of course, I used to help him in the dark room, and we used to help him putting his slides in numerical order and things like that. What countries and buildings do you remember traveling to growing up? You know, one of the greatest experiences is Ranchon, the church that's about an hour and a half, two hours west of Basel, built by Le Corbusier, the famous Swiss oh, sure. yeah. architect. And it's much more than a chapel. The site itself has incredible magnetism. And so this is one type of inspiration. I remember a modern church in La Rochelle on the west coast of France that stuck with me. And with the Hillman Minx, the the little car we were driving around, we went through Germany one summer. And my dad couldn't speak German, but he had one phrase that he knew, Wo ist die neue Kirche? Where is the new church? (laughs) Right. I don't know any German, but I could pick that one out. (laughs) And then the people would just gesture and point, and he would say, Danke schön. But the Neue Kirche, of course, was the subject of one of his books, The New Churches of Europe. Europe, which was so devastated during the Second World War, was rebuilding, and the churches were an important part. Michelangelo, Kidder Smith really did something that we take for granted now, he branded these books like a Harry Potter sequel. Right. It was Italy Bills or France Bills, right? I mean, he had a series. Right. So it was uh, Switzerland Bills, Italy Bills, Brazil Bills. So now the Brazil Bills goes back to the early 40s in the context of MoMA. uh, And it was an important book that he didn't write, but he photographed. And it's important to mention that he was also not only the photographer, with the exception of Brazil Bills, but he was author and photographer. And so that's not so typical, right? He was based in New York, which was where all the publishing houses were based, the graphic designers, and and all, most importantly, the funding or a majority of the funding agencies that enabled him to not respond to commissions by other architects, but rather to pursue his own book projects, right? So he was fiercely independent and he had to suffer through the agony of, you know, making a number of requests for funding, whether it was to the AIA, whether it was to, you know, Brown, whether it was to MoMA. And so he was an incredibly industrious guy, but also fiercely independent. And I'm sure Hoppy can speak to that because in fact, from the, when he graduated in the thirties, I mean, the war, the expectation was that, you know, you started to go into practice or you were an academic, but he was a a very rare bird, I would say. To go back to the beginnings, he graduated from college in Princeton in 1935. He went to graduate school at Princeton. He did serve a time in an office, architectural firm. And then actually during the war, he did something typical. That is, he, f- he made a job for himself to photograph naval installations of the United States Navy in many different parts of the world. And so this was something he invented. It was something useful and there's something that he could do especially well. And he was all through the Pacific in India, Burma, and different parts of the States photographing the naval installations, the ships themselves sometimes and interesting points that were connected with these feats of engineering. And he also, in his career, did a great three-volume work on American architecture. Right. According to MIT, who holds these archives, it represents about 12 years of work and 135,000 miles of travel. Is that right? It's true. Right. So the three volumes you're referring to is the architecture of the United States, and they were published in 19... 81, 
with the support of the Museum of Modern Art, which is very interesting because, of course, he was not only focusing on 20th century buildings, he was going back to Pueblo as well. And so it's very interesting if you look on the cover of these three huge tomes, and it says, an illustrated guide to notable buildings open to the public. So I think this is hugely important. 1981, we didn't have our iPhones that told us when we were on the road, you know, when we could access buildings and stuff like that. And so this was really a huge service. And it's not just to the specialized, you know, the profession, architects or landscape architects or urbanists, but rather to the general public. And so this was really a huge endeavor that was sort of prefaced by the American Bicentennial, 1976. He did a two-volume, uh, beautiful coffee table with slipcase set of uh, the architecture of the United States. That was basically the beginning of what would become this three-volume set. So in this regard, if you ask folks, like if they have this three-volume set or the previous one of a pictorial history of architecture in America, 76, he shifted, you know, to America after years of going around in the world to Italy and to Sweden. And, you know, with the 70s, he really hit the road in America and really worked hard to advocate for uh, the built environment in his own country. And I didn't realize until reading the book that he had a series on PBS. Oh, yeah. And that, now remember, this was also the bicentennial it was Architectural Odyssey, right? And just to go back to what Hoppy mentioned about Dorothea or Dot, as she was referred to, his mom, she was actually a very substantial collaborator. If you look at all the books, he increasingly is very, this is Peter Smith, is explicit about thanking her. And then in Architectural Odyssey, that's why I'm bringing her up, and she actually appears going in a horse-drawn carriage in Colonial Williamsburg or on the lawn at UVA. Uh, so I think that he begins really to pull her from out of the background and give her the due that she deserved in terms of basically enabling this collaborative process. You know, 140,000 miles can be very lonely driving if you don't have uh, a, a companion skeleton collaborator. Right. Correct, correct. Now, did he appear in the documentary on camera? Yeah, absolutely. He was the narrator. You okay. know, and so it's really worth seeing. And, you know, you, George, who's a man uh, close to the heart of the people, the general audience, I did a little research and I put it in the foreword. That was actually one of the really first broad audience architectural documentary sort of thing that would be followed by PBS, Bob Stern's Pride of Clay, Spiro Kostov's America by Design. But these were all in the early 80s. But so Kidder Smith's, you know, an architectural odyssey of 76 is really kind of pioneering, it seems to me. Now, Hoppy, in the New York Times obituary of your dad, it noted that he was a civic watchdog, that he'd written more than 70 letters to the editor about matters involving preservation in New York. What caused that? He had an enormous sense of civic responsibility. And it was not only New York City and the ameliorations that he was suggesting. It was actually world politics as well. I can give you one example. When the U.S. Embassy in Tehran was overrun by so-called students, he wrote a letter to the Times saying, at this point, every other embassy should close their embassies there. Every other country should close their embassies there, just because this is a point beyond which you cannot go. And, uh, of course, <laughs> this wasn't, wasn't necessarily effective in any way, but it just shows the, the imagination and the sense of, of decorum and, and human values that was at the basis of a lot of his thinking. And just to uh, add to that, although he was based in New York, remember, he was very instrumental in advocating against the demolition of the Roby House here in Chicago, Hyde Park. The book has a little part dedicated to that. In addition to the Villa Savoie, 
which also lay as a haystack. In fact, there's this beautiful image that uh, is published in the book where you can see the abandon of the Villa Savoie. So the Villa Savoie, early 1930s, this was you know, modern was always meant to be new, but yet it was began to pose some philosophical challenges in terms of preservation and stewardship of these buildings. So in this regard, Kidder Smith was also very much active. He was a quintessential educator, though he only taught briefly a semester at Yale, a semester at MIT. Everything, everything he did, his books, his civic watchdog was motivated by a real deep commitment to educating the general public as well as the professionals about how to ensure that the built environment could be a beautiful and a civically inspiring place. I imagine that when Penn Station was destroyed in the 60s, he must have been very upset. I would imagine so. And because, remember, he was from the South. He loved classical architecture, even though he was ultimately a modernist. But, you know, he has plenty of early photographs of visits to Greece. He also had a sense of history in the sense that he was not an ideologue. He embraced the modern, but he was also someone seeing that the modern was an addition, a layer, a multi-layered dimension of time. So uh, I would say that is probably something that sets him out apart. And, you know, he trained at Princeton in the 30s. That overlapped with Labatou, who, of course, we know to be a teacher of teachers, Robert Venturi, many others. So there was a special vibe during those years. Uh, Labatou, of course, was a Beaux-Arts trained architect. So back to his love for the train station, for sure, he would have been appalled by that, as were many. Now, Kidder Smith's photographs were well known for including people as well as the buildings, which is not something most architecture photographers did at the time. How did he start doing that? The, the classic definition is a scale figure. To give an idea of how big the building actually is, or if it's a monument, or if it's just a a doorway or something, that the person gives it a scale. And also, it's just the human element, the unpredictable human element in the photograph of a building that gives it another angle. And this was very much part of his approach, humanist approach. Right. To that, I will add that, of course, The majority, or oftentimes, guess who actually serves as a scale figure? It's actually Dot. Uh In fact, that even himself, he does a lot of self-portraits, but this is a funny story. So Zeckendorf's autobiography, Developing My Life, was recently reissued by Oro. And I opened it up, and there, uh, sure enough, was a photo by Kidder Smith of the Roby House. Now, how did I know that was Kidder Smith? And they did credit it, by the way. And I I immediately saw Dot walking on the street. And that was the same image that we published in the book. And so it was obvious that, you know, she didn't have to be paid. Uh, You know, she was a collaboration. Price was right. So it wasn't like a Henri Cartier-Bresson sort of crowds of people or like, you know, the uh, chance encounters. It was typically just one or two scale figures, so to speak that he systematically sort of put in. One other thing to remember of the photos is that he typically was not doing interiors, right? Because given his intense pace, remember this guy was having to ask for grants per diem, right? So he wasn't able to wait around for three days to set up equipment for lighting and all that stuff. So he was mostly outdoor photographer, And he had to wait for the light, of course, to be right. But it's a whole different challenge when you're photographing from inside. And so all of these sort of organizational issues, including capturing someone walking next to the building at the right time, were part of the challenge that he had. I wrote that he was, he had Wanderlust, you know, he loved (laughs) to travel, but he was no flaneur. 
because he couldn't afford to be a flaneur. He had to like hustle to get uh, buildings photographed. Qu'est-ce que c'est un flaneur? Flaneur is the Baudelairian term uh, for someone that sort of languishes or observes the urban context. Oh. Hoppy, am I right to say that he loved traveling, but he was no flaneur? <laughs> That's right. He didn't linger. <laughs> yeah. And one thing about the outdoor photographs is his eye for natural light. First of all, if he was photographing in a city, he'd always try to get the take the pictures on a Sunday morning when the traffic is the lightest. And um, sometimes he would get up very early in the morning if it was summertime. He knew the light, how the sun would be at five in the morning. And uh, he would go out and try and get his picture. <laughs> and if we were with him, we'd wait for him for breakfast, then he'd come back. This sounds like movie producers who are always looking for the golden hour, you know, right before sunrise or sunset, uh -huh. to shoot their important scenes. Right. And this is, of course, the days when there was no Photoshop to correct everything. So there's a real sense of like craft here and dedication, as Hoppy is saying, you know, he really had to get out there and make sure that he was able to capture these buildings in their best light. The book is G.E. Kidder Smith Builds, The Travel of Architecture Photography. Thank you both for coming on the show. Well, thanks for your interest, George. And thank you, George, for being such an enthusiastic steward of all things modern. We were speaking with Michelangelo Sabatino and Hoppy Smith about Hoppy's father, G.E. Kidder Smith. As we mentioned earlier, Hoppy is an accomplished performer on the lute. Here's a little taste of his skills performing a piece by Bach. Detroit, the Motor City, has a fascinating history. Belle Isle Park is the largest urban island park in the country, at a thousand acres. The key word here is island, as there are many larger city parks. This one, though, was created by New York Central Park's Frederick Law Olmsted, the architect in New York City. Techno music was invented in Detroit in the late 80s. Detroit had the first paved road the first individually assigned phone numbers. Really? And the second largest theater district after New York, with 30,000 seats. Lots of famous people come from Detroit, like civil rights activist Rosa Parks, architect Minoru Yamasaki, car makers Henry Ford and John DeLorean, Motown's Barry Gordy, Cher's ex, Sonny Bono, overlooked Ghostbuster, Ernie <laughs> Hudson, <laughs> okay. that girl Marlo Thomas, Alice Cooper, Eminem, Madonna, the still-missing Jimmy Hoffa, and the king of all things delicious but remarkably unhealthy, Oscar Meyer. He's a real person? Yes. <laughs> wow. Today, we welcome another noted Detroit citizen, architect Michael Porras. In 1994, he co-founded Macintosh Porras Associates. A graduate of the University of Michigan, Michael earned degrees at Yale and at SciArc, the Hogwarts of design schools, before returning to the Detroit area to specialize in restoring old buildings instead of tearing them down. In Detroit, a town known for teardowns and abandonments, this skill could not be more important. Michael and his firm have won over 130 design awards, and recently he received AIA Detroit's Charles Blessing Award for his 27 years of service to the community. Welcome, Michael. Thanks. Great to be here. Michael, you and your late partner, Douglas McIntosh, both grew up in the Detroit area and knew each other as kids. What was Detroit like back then? Uh... Growing up in the suburbs, it was an exciting time. It was a time, you know, when you're kids, you don't realize what's going on in the early 60s and through the 60s and into the 70s. There was actually quite a bit going on still as far as development of the city, the kind of fall of the city, but even with the growth of the suburbs and 
you know, Yamasaki was around. We, I actually had interaction with him as a kid. My father did work with him and, you know, there was, there was a lot going on, going on. I grew up in a neighborhood that was all prefab homes from the fifties, but you don't know these things as a kid. So it was actually pretty exciting. Well, Detroit has quite a history. And what we see on the news for people that don't live there are the civil rights abuses, riots, the abandonment of downtown, a failed subway system, the arrival of casinos, which were supposed to bring prosperity, but of course didn't. The city went bankrupt and was taken over for a while by the state. And then just hundreds of houses abandoned by their owners. And then things started to turn around. What caused that turnaround? Well, they they were turning around before that. It was the momentum really picked up since around 2011, since right after the big recession. But there was things happening since we came back in 94, 95. It just started out very slowly and really hit momentum. And I think a, a big piece of that um, in 2011 was with Bedrock and um Quicken Loans moving downtown and bringing billions of dollars in development downtown, bringing their 12,000 employees downtown, buying 90 vacant buildings. And um, wow. So that really. 90 started. buildings? Yes. Yes. Dan Gilbert, the owner of Quicken Loans, called it a skyscraper sale. Um, <laughs> there were 90 vacant buildings, which we had been trying to save for years from being torn down. And then, you know, somebody finally figured out, oh, hey, you know, people want to be in downtown areas and we have all these great old buildings and that he could pick up for very little money and renovate. You know, 20 years of uh, working to get people to keep that it had paid off. So that was a big turnaround. I also think Eminem's Super Bowl commercial was in 2011 that was filmed in Detroit. And I really feel like that was a tipping point for the, the vision of what people thought about the city. Now, modernist architecture is really big in L.A. And you spent some time out there after SciArc working with Frank Israel. What had you come back to Detroit? So I actually worked with a number of people. I worked with Cesar Pelli in New Haven. I worked with Frank Israel, as you mentioned, Frank Gehry, Richard Meyer, Morphosis for a couple of years. Um, so I'd worked with quite a few people. And I got licensed in L.A. in 94 and started out on my own. And there was really no one left that I wanted to work for. And once I got licensed, I realized, well, this is what I did this for. And um, my late business partner, Doug McIntosh, got a project here. I came back to work with them on that project, and that just led to more projects. And it became clear to us that as young architects, we were 32 at the time, that this was where we should be. Uh, we could make a difference here. We looked at Detroit like Berlin after the war, or Beirut, and it was like, you know, it was just working on the coasts in New York or L.A. We were just one of many, but coming here with our backgrounds we really thought we could make a difference here and that it would have some meaning long term. Besides all those skyscrapers downtowns that were empty, there were square miles of houses that were just left, right? Yeah, that, that's been ongoing. There's 140 square miles in the city, which is the size of San Francisco, Boston, and New York combined. Wow. So there's Wow. Yeah, and the, the city, it partly it grew with the growth of the automobile industry. So if you go back 100 years, 115 years, from 1905 to 1920, the size of the city grew from about 10 square miles to 140 square miles as the industry grew. And the, the number of people coming to the city to work in the auto industry back then was gigantic because it went from building the first Model Ts in 1905 to, you know, 50 million of them built by the 30s, let's say. So there was a huge growth. So the city just kept growing. And single-family homes were what got built because Henry Ford, you know, paid that $5 a day, which was enough for people to have a house and a car and, you know, really built the middle class. And that was what grew the city different than many other cities where there was a lot more 
multifamily apartment buildings. You know, so the city grew massively with these houses. It peaked in 1953 at around 2 million people and then started declining after that. And people started moving out of the city down to the 600,000 that we are today. Six, wow, that is a huge decline. So that began in the mid-50s, the decline? Yes. I would have thought that the auto industry was still going gangbusters at that time. It was, it was, but there were a number of factors. So up until that point, 80% of the cars built in the country, maybe the world, were built in Detroit. And then the factories started expanding out across the country. All those states, Tom, that were giving economic incentives to relocate. Yeah. <laughs> it was partly the military, too. They, After World War II, well, the arsenal bureaucracy, we were building everything in Detroit. But then uh, there was a concern about having all the industry centered in one place. Like it was, you know, Russia could drop a bomb in the Cold War and there goes your industry. So they oh. literally spread it out. A lot of it had to do with government. Decentralized industry was one thing, one piece most people don't realize. So that was a bad part. Plus the 1950 master plan for the city, because the growth was so fast from early 1900s to 1940, the housing was falling apart. It, it hadn't kept up. So there was just a lot that needed to be done. So the planning for after the war created the 1950 master plan, which was urban renewal. And that's what built the freeways. The very first freeway in the city or in the country was the Davidson Freeway built during the war to move the bombers and things that they were building at you know, the plants from, I mean, it's crazy stuff. So that development of the freeways and the urban renewal, the housing and all the different districts, Corktown Industrial District, the Medical Center District, the Grassroot Redevelopment and, and all the redevelopment started construction in the 50s. And that meant kicking people out of their homes, eminent domain, and building the freeways to the suburbs and and then all the subsidy for the suburbs you know, that just created a perfect storm. And people started moving out to the suburbs where there was housing being built, malls being built, freeways to take them out there. And it was, it was just where the country was going at that point. There's a show on HGTV called Bargain Block that stars Keith Bynum and Evan Thomas that buy up these boarded, abandoned houses in Detroit, sometimes like for a thousand bucks. And fix them up. Have you seen that show? I've not seen the show, but I've seen it live. <laughs> yeah. Has housing started to pick up now as adaptive reuse like Quicken did with downtown 10 years ago? Oh, yeah. Well, actually, now uh, a lot of the focus has moved from downtown to the neighborhoods. A lot of those houses, that there's a lot of reasons that they became vacant and it continued. A lot of them really hit during the recession, during the mortgage crisis, and, and nearly 100,000 homes went back to the state and then the city. So as people were evicted, often for not paying taxes, the houses got abandoned, and there's been a movement forever to just keep demolishing them. And I think that started to change in the last 10, 15 years to try to renovate more of them and keep more of them and create subsidies for people to buy them and renovate them, We're looking at ways to make the neighborhoods more attractive. And it's definitely happening, trying to figure out ways to keep people in their houses. Lowering the property taxes in Detroit are one of the highest in the country, which is, you know, if you're poor and your property taxes are high, it, it, it's enough to get you out of the house, which is a really bad situation. So, yeah, there's definitely been some growth in keeping them. Plus, one thing that's happened is Detroit's actually one of the most affordable cities in the country for first-time buyers. People coming here, a lot of the younger, like Detroit's like Brooklyn right now in some ways. You can go down and go to a coffee shop and you're looking around, there's all these sort of hipsters and what's going on. You realize they live in that neighborhood. They're buying these homes or $50,000, let's say they move here from Brooklyn or some LA or Chicago, and they're in their 20s and they can buy a house and renovate it 
for much less than they could rent an apartment in any of those cities. Well, one of the projects that I find really fascinating is your work on Fisher Body Plant 21, which was a car body plant that was used until 84 and has been abandoned ever since. And you're going to turn it into 400-some apartments. Yes, that's ongoing right now. This is a it's it's a great building. It's been sitting there as an eyesore. Like you know, frankly, I don't think anyone ever thought it would be. We could renovate it. We we did a master plan in that neighborhood 25 years ago, that left that for industrial, but created mixed use housing. We built 90 townhouses and the saved the Paquette plant, which is where Ford started. Built the first Model Ts. So the, the, the neighborhood has a lot of great history. and We never thought we'd be coming back 25 years later to take on this building. We thought environmentally it was probably long gone, but it actually has been fixed up. So it, it's great to come back to this neighborhood this long after and be working on this. And tell us about the Assembly, one of your projects that won the 2022 AIA Detroit Best Building Award. Uh, the Assembly is down on the right near the West Riverfront on Fort Street. (laughs) We jokingly call it Corktown Shores. And there's a big swath of the West Riverfront that used to be train yards that are long gone that's being turned into the the West Riverfront Park, which is a huge undertaking that's being built. And the assembly is a old industrial building on Fort Street that we did a historic renovation of and turned it into a mixed-use building with commercial on the first three floors and then the fourth floor residential and a fifth floor addition of residential. So the the fourth and fifth floor or apartments and the three floors below are sort of a light industrial office, so kind of a loft workspace that could be for makers. That was the original idea was that it wasn't just regular office space. It was also for companies that could be making stuff, too. Now, for the assembly as well as the Fisher Body Plant, how much of these new units are going to be what we would consider affordable housing, like non-market rate housing? Um, so both of these are 20% affordable, Okay, which is pretty much a mandate by the city now for most new projects. So uh, Fisher is 20% affordable. Is the city engaging on any projects of its own where it's all affordable housing? Well, that's happening in the city, not necessarily by the city. Um, Okay. uh, There's low-income housing, tax credits, um, LIHTC. They're not necessarily always 100% affordable. There are some like that. Different cities have different funding mechanisms. So like Chicago, for instance, has a system that I wish we had here that uh, where they actually do have a separate funding through the city for 100 percent affordable. We don't have that here. We're, uh, that might change now with the, the change in the Michigan legislature to Democrats. So we're kind of hoping that there'll be more funding for affordable housing coming down the line. But there's definitely a growth for it. We we work with a nonprofit developer called Develop Detroit and we did a just finished a project with them, Sugar Hill, that's typically a mix of affordable and market. Now Michael, who are some Detroit architects people should know besides you and Minoru Yamasaki, who we've talked about on the show before? Well, there's quite a few. I actually coined a phrase the Detroit School, and I think it's something I'd love to see people catch on to. If you go back a hundred years, there was the Arts and Crafts Society of Detroit. And out of that group came George Booth, who ended up building Cranbrook uh, and hiring Eliel Saarinen to build Cranbrook. Also that came out of that was CCS, the College for Creative Studies, and Poabic Pottery. The, The Society of Arts and Crafts was all about handcraft in the age of industry, which now, you know, 120 years later is still relevant here all over the place, really. So then you have Eliel Saarinen, whose son, Aero Saarinen, comes into the fold. So the two of them are up in Bloomfield Hills. 
And out of them, a number of other architects, Charles Eames came out of that group. There was Alexander Gerard, who went on, did quite a bit of work with Herman Miller. Well, and you had Yamasaki, and one thing most people don't realize is Yamasaki and Errol Saarinen were pretty close. They worked on the GM Tech Center together. Uh, Yamasaki was the head of design at Smith Hinchman, who was the architect of record on the Tech Center when Saarinen was the design architect. So they actually were pretty close, and it's interesting because their work in some ways is related with the sort of ornamental modernism that they both were kind of doing. And then there's Albert Kahn, who basically created cast-in-place concrete and factories and was building factories all over the world. The spin-offs from Yamasaki, like Gunnar Burkert's, Kessler was here. Kessler went to Harvard and worked and studied under Gropius, and he was a great sort of modern architect here for quite a while. There's a whole bunch that came out of here, if you think back to Cranbrook, whether it's Eames or Pretoria, Harry Weiss. Cesar Pelli, Kevin Roche, John Dinkaloo, they were all here <laughs> in the 50s and the, into the 60s. I read that you can take a tour still of abandoned Detroit buildings downtown. Um, I'm not sure there's that many tours. Most of the tours were like going on your own and splunking and exploring. There might have been individual ones like for theaters. There were a bunch of empty theaters up until recently. But exploring abandoned buildings was an activity that people often did just out of curiosity. We did it quite a bit out of trying to figure out what to do with them and and often looking at them with people and how to make them happen. It's become kind of looked down upon now in in Detroit because we don't really want to celebrate them as disasters, but more as something to bring back. And we really want to see them renovated. Well, Michael, thank you so much for everything that you're doing to bring Detroit back. Well, thank you. It's been a a great time for the last 20-something years, and uh, pretty proud of what we've been able to do. Returning podcast guest Diana Panton got her start in the Hamilton, Ontario All-Star Jazz Band. In 2005, she released her first studio album, Yesterday Perhaps, and in 2009, her second album, If the Moon Turns Green, was nominated for a Juno, the Canadian version of the Grammys, for Best Vocal Jazz Album. Her 2015 album, Red, won a Juno as well. When she's not singing, she's teaching French, art, and drama at the Westdale Secondary School in Hamilton. Go Warriors! It's also where actors Eugene Levy, economist Myron Scholes, and comedian Martin Short went to high school. Welcome back, Diana. Yeah, thanks for that great introduction. (laughs) It's so nice to have you back on the show, Diana. I'm really thrilled about your new album, Blue. Tell us about it. Well, um, you mentioned Red there in the introduction, and this one is the sequel to that album, and it actually is part of a trilogy. So there was a pink album that started it all off, followed by Red and now Blue, and unfortunately, it's the end of a relationship that was going a little better (laughs) earlier on. (laughs) Was there a person involved here? No, I mean, I think, actually, it's kind of funny, but I... I did my first release in 2005, and I already had the Blue Album in mind way back then. I had even considered it as my debut album, and I just thought it would be a little bit too heavy to come out with that one first. And that got me thinking when and how I would release it. So it's a collection of sadder material, and I just thought it would benefit from me having a bit more life experience. Um, And that sort of generated the idea for Pink, actually, where I came up with love songs that I thought would be more suitable for somebody to sing when they're a bit younger. I've kind of revised a little of my vision with that because I figure, you know, with Pink, you could be any age to fall in love and it's not the realm of the young. But I think when I initially came up with the trilogy idea, because this whole thing spans about a decade, 
10 years ago when I was contemplating the trilogy. That sort of was my mindset. So that's what happened with Pink. And then I, I separated each of the recordings with different recordings just so it wouldn't be too obvious. So I don't think people were necessarily expecting Blue, but... Um, but you've been planning it for a long time. Yeah. For a very long time, yeah. yeah. Well, what's that song from The Music Man, The Sadder But Wiser Girls, A Girl For Me? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I've always been attracted to, like, s- slower and sadder songs. Um, but I just felt like if I put that out first, people might be a little bit... Um, uh, all she sings is know, sad might, songs. I find it hard to digest. Right. This is a beautiful album, and this song, From Blue, was written by Johnny Mandel and one of the greatest lyricists of all time, Dave Frischberg, who passed away in 2021 at the age of 88. Dave's songs have been performed by the incomparable Blossom Deary, Diana Krall, past podcast guests Rebecca Kilgore and Stacey Kent, Bette Midler, John Pizzarelli, and the Velvet Fog, Mel Torme. But most people know him from the music and lyrics for I'm Just a Bill, the song about the legislative process on Uh ABC's Schoolhouse Rock series, which later became Schoolhouse Rock Live. Here's Diana with You Are There. In the evening, when the kettle's on for tea, an old familiar feeling settles over me, and it's your face I see, and I believe that you are there in a garden. Stop to touch a rose And feel the petals soft and sweet Against my nose I smile and I suppose That somehow maybe you are there When I'm dreaming And I find myself awake Without a warning And I rub my eyes and fantasize And all at once I realize It's morning And my fantasy is fading Like a distant star at dawn My dearest dream is gone Just one thing to do Pretend the dream was true And tell myself that you That's so beautiful. Wow. It's a beautiful song. How did you find this one? Um, that's an example of a song that I've I've just, I don't know, I've come across. It's a quintessential jazz standard. I've known it for a long time, but again, I just, I, I didn't maybe feel ready to sing it earlier in life. I mean, it's it's got a pretty strong message to it, you know, and... Uh, It became that much stronger when we were working on it through the pandemic and, you know, realizing that people were losing people, that Dave himself passed away. And interestingly, I heard from Dave's publisher on this one, and his wife actually asked for a copy of this. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. But he he was a very diverse songwriter, you know, and he wrote a lot of really funny material, too. But this one is just one of the saddest, I think. Diana, you and I both got featured in a Globe and Mail article Mm -hmm. on our podcast, and they mentioned you as a guest. What's some good modernist architecture in Hamilton that we should come up and see? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, they do have some Bauhaus ar- architecture in Hamilton. I think okay. there's four or five houses that have been quite an interest to people who are into modern architecture. So that's what I would recommend. We have some oddities as well, like our hospital is very modern and has, uh, I can't remember who designed it, but it was sort of controversial at the time in the way a Pompidou Center might be that it had internal pipes that were um, oh, exposed, showing through. Well, the, there's glass, and so you can see them, and uh-huh. some people didn't prefer that. But apparently, the architect, it was sort of his grand vision, and they, he wasn't able to build it elsewhere. Hamilton let him build it. So I can't remember who built that, though, but McMaster University Hospital. Um, which is a children's hospital now, but I would I would probably say the Bauhaus houses might be interesting though. Hang on a second, I'm gonna look this up. Masters University sure. <laughs> Hospital, yeah. a medical center. Yeah. Oh wow, that is an interesting looking building. <laughs> See, and it's okay. all concrete. It's very heavy. Yeah, heavy looking. <laughs> uh, you can Google anyway, McMaster so you University can... Medical Center to see yeah. this. There's also a building we found called Hamilton Place, the first Ontario Concert Hall. Yes, I've, I've sung in there. You, you, you must have sung in there, right? Yes. Yeah. And the Art Gallery of Hamilton on Commonwealth Square. Yes. So you've got a couple nice ones there. We do, and we also have a lot of you know traditional architecture as well. So there's a nice kind of melding of things. It's it's quite diverse, you know. Now, Diana, what jazz singers of today do you follow? I'm a bit of an old soul, to be honest. Um, my favorite year for music is probably 1957. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's people I appreciate that are doing music today, like Cecile McLaurin Salvant, I think is definitely a, a vocalist worthy of people's attention. She has a lot of the qualities that I like from singers from before, which is just interesting tone. She has a pretty interesting diverse repertoire, which she kind of digs all over the place for that kind of stuff. So I always find interesting what she comes up with. And she's also adding her own standards into the mix as well. 1957 was a big year for Paul Desmond. Do you know his work? Yeah, I love Paul Desmond. You know, if you ask me three instrumentalists that I would love to collaborate with today, if I could, Paul Desmond would probably be one of them. (laughs) <laughs> so that's kind of not surprising for me. I, it's just an aesthetic in that time period that I really appreciate. And he's, with his sound, kind of clean and restrained. Again, maybe terms that one would use for architecture too, but I, I really like his playing very much. Another famous jazz singer and composer, Billie Holiday, who died in 1959, inspired generations of jazz performers and my mom with new ways of phrasing and tempo. She toured with Artie Shaw and Count Basie, and after a string of legal problems, she emerged from prison to a huge comeback at Carnegie Hall in New York. Billie Holiday won four Grammys, all of them posthumously, and recently there's a documentary, The United States vs. Billie Holiday. From her album Blue, here's Diana with a song sung by Billie Holiday, written by Fred Stryker and Johnny Lang, Without Your Love. Without 
Diana, now that the pandemic's over, are you going out on the road again, do some performances? I probably should be, but no, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't got myself back to that. I see that you've got one gig on the schedule in Kitchener in May. Yeah, so that's going to be a really nice one, actually, because um, it'll be the first time that we're collaborating with the Pendereki Quartet, who appeared on the album. But due to the pandemic, we weren't even in allowed all in the studio at once. Uh, so oh. this will be the first time we'll be doing everything together as a group. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to That's that. That's got to be exciting. Yeah, very much so. And especially, you know, as a, a jazz vocalist, it, it's on rare occasion that you get to have a string quartet with you on a performance. I have done it before, but it's once in a while, <laughs> once every five or ten years. So that's going to be a really special occasion for all of us. Well, please keep me posted on your touring schedule. I would love to come and see you perform. Yeah, just I, I, you know, I haven't been out and about that much, but if there's any way for you to get to that one, that would be a particularly nice one. And I think also on the 13th of May, I'll be performing, but just with Reg, probably on Reg Schwager on guitar in Westdale, near where I live, in an old movie theater that's been transformed into movie theater slash performance space. Diana, thank you so much for coming back on the show. This album is wonderful. Well, thank you so much for listening to it, for promoting it, and for having me back on. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman Family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl with guest research by Kelly Policelli. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another edition, our 293rd edition of U.S. Modernist Radio, the world's number one architecture and jazz podcast. That's because it's the world's only architecture and jazz podcast. Mm-hmm.